Hi everyone, I'm here with Malin Lobb, Senior SIV Instructor and owner of Flyio Parapont. And this is Matt Wilkes, a Medical Officer at the Extreme Environments Lab in Portsmouth and a paragliding researcher. So in this video, we're going to talk about water rescue techniques for SIV training. We're going to talk about what is the appropriate equipment to have available and how to adapt first aid to an SIV situation. This is a pretty long video. It's aimed at professionals, but we've definitely got some good takeaways for solo pilots. And we're going to try and hit those early on. But if you want to watch the whole video, that'd be great. We hope you find it thought provoking and we hope you enjoy the watch. Recommendations for the student. To reduce the entanglement in lines, the student should use circular motions with their lower hand whilst looking in the direction of travel without using their legs. So, Malin, uh, why did you decide to bring all this together? Um, yeah, so unfortunately there was a, a serious accident last year on the lake. And um, all the schools that were there all came together together for this rescue effort. It was a really nice team spirit, but it definitely, for me, highlighted some weaknesses in current rescue training. I've, I thought for a few years just having a rescue boat isn't enough in a, a really serious situation, so this highlighted some points that we could be more efficient. So, as you say, Malin, these things happen quite rarely, but with rare events, sometimes you still need to practice them often so that when they happen, you're current. And also sometimes you need to bring in outside expert help. And so we were very lucky that when we were doing this project, we brought in Dr. Paddy Morgan and A.D. Mayhew from Surf Life Saving GB, who are both experts on swift water rescue, rescue in small boats, and they were absolutely invaluable in us approaching this in an organised way. So what was it you, you learned from them in particular, would you say? So the first thing was that they separated quite quickly the different pilots you want to come across in, in the lake. So there's four different kind of types. Uh, and then the second is not to diverge much from your standard rescue procedure to when there's a serious incident. So the procedure for me to get predominantly 99% of the pilots out of the water, they're going to be uninjured. The process for getting them out of the water and if someone was unconscious, for me is the same, the way that I pull the boat up, the way that I handle the, the person in the water, there's just a tiny variation. So it means that my normal day-to-day -day job, if I get someone out of the water, um, I'm practicing for the, the more serious event. That makes total sense. And that way, at least, if you are practicing every single day, when it happens, it'll be automatic, yeah. we hope. Luckily, I don't get someone in the water every single day. <laughs> I would question my ability, but yeah. So as an avid SIV student yourself, um, what did you learn from this? I learned quite a lot as a participant. I learned that if I were to end up in the water, then there are certainly things that I can do to help myself. So I learned that I need to take a moment when I hit the water just to float, to get my head above the water. So if I'm gasping or anything like that, I don't inhale anything. I need to kind of look up to the sky and just use one hand just to roll myself over, just to keep my head above water, let the life jacket do its job and not move my legs too much to avoid entangling myself. And what was quite interesting is we arrived that this was the right thing for us to be doing, but it also fits in with some of the national stuff that's going on around this idea of floating to live if you end up in the water. And we're going to have a link in the notes here at the bottom about the, the RNLI float to live campaign. I think it also is going to make me pay more attention if I go to an SIV school as to, to how they've thought about rescue. Like, do they have a plan? Do they have the right equipment? Are the life jackets good enough? And we're going to spend quite a lot of time in this video talking about life jackets. And also, you know, is there a pre-course briefing? Are we telling people what they need to do when they land up in the water? And I guess, speaking of landing up in the water, uh, it's also made me think a lot about not training solo over water. I know that's something you feel quite strongly about. Yeah, for sure. So we have people that come into Flyo asking if we sell life jackets because they want to go and train over the water and there isn't a dedicated rescue boat here. People just think it's the safest option, but without a safety boat, it is a really bad idea. Once your wing is filled with water, if there's any sort of current, you can get dragged under pretty quick. If you do impact the water hard and you're unconscious, uh, and you haven't got a suitable life jacket, as you'll see in some of the, the videos, it can be really detrimental. You know, if you train over trees, you can end up in a tree and you can sit there all night contemplating your life choices. But if you end up in the water alone, it can turn bad very quickly. So um, without a boat, just don't do it. So I guess we've touched on life jackets, so maybe let's start with that. So next we're going to show you some videos that we shot last summer. The first, we'll look at the different types of uh, life jackets and uh, how useful they are. Life jacket tests. Foam life jacket. The buoyancy of the life jacket was nowhere near enough to counteract the buoyancy of the harness. And in the unconscious test, the victim's head was well below water level. 
auto-inflating life jacket 150 newton. The 150 life jacket offered better buoyancy to counteract the buoyancy of the harness and even allowed the victim to turn onto their back, albeit with kicking their legs which would lead to greater entanglement with the lines. Although in the unconscious test the victim's airway was still in the water. Auto-inflating life jacket 250 newtons. The 250 life jacket offered by far the most buoyancy, comfort and stability for the victim. In the sideways position, the victim's head was well supported and the airway was clear of the water. Even when we increased the buoyancy of the harness by pulling it up, the head still remained above the waterline. Although in the downward position, without the use of a crotch strap, the victim's head fell below the waterline, obstructing the airways. When the instructor reaches an unconscious victim, they should use a twisting motion on the life jacket to place the victim in the recovery position and removing the airways from the waterline. So, I mean, looking at those life jacket tests, it was quite interesting because, you know, I weigh 65, 66 kilos and it was pretty clear that I needed quite a chunky life jacket to keep my head above water. Yeah, for sure. And depending on the, the type of harness you have, if you have a more of a competition type harness, that can make a big difference. One of the reasons why I got the rescue board in the, in the first place was um, just trying to get a student who weighed 90 kilos with a comp harness and I rolled into the boat and the boat is only a foot out of the water. He was uninjured and just came down on reserve, but actually just trying to manhandle him in the boat um, was very difficult. So I think that's a really important point with anyone doing this is to have a board low enough in the water that if you're dealing with someone unconscious, you can you can pull them in. Well, that's probably quite a good point then to get into these rescue techniques. Perhaps we could break down the four different types of casualty and then we'll look at ways of getting them into the boat. Yeah, so the four different types are uninjured and uh, untangled, uninjured but tangled, which is the predominant uh, student we, we would deal with, injured and tangled, and then um, injured and unconscious um, and or worst case scenario, not breathing. And again, we'll go back to the videos of uh, the tests we did. Great. Self-rescue, uninjured and unentangled. The rescue board was not stable if the student tried to enter from either the front or the back. The student should enter from the side of the board whilst facing the boat. The board should be tipped at an angle and then placed flat by the instructor to aid the student on board. At this point, some air can be removed from the life jacket to help with mobility. Self-rescue, uninjured but tangled. Once in the water, entanglement in the lines happens very quickly. This is the result of treading water for 10 seconds. The process for self-rescue when tangled is the same as before. More upper body strength is needed and in reality I would be offering more assistance to my student at this point. Although you can see without assistance, it is still possible for the student to self-rescue. Once on the rescue board, the student can easily climb aboard the boat. Rescue, injured and tangled. At this point, we have a few different options. There are different techniques that can be used to mount the victim onto the rescue board, depending on their injuries. For suspected spinal injuries, leaving the victim in the water offered good support with minimal movement. Attaching the victim to the boat and placing their legs on the rescue board offered excellent buoyancy with minimal movement to the casualty. The time of the year and the temperature of the water would have to be considered in this situation. Rescue. Injured, unconscious and or not breathing. The unconscious victim should be turned so that they are facing away from the boat. They should be placed parallel to the rescue board and pulled on with their harness. In this moment, if impeded by tangled lines, a hook knife should be used to free the victim. If the casualty is not breathing, once on the board, the hook knife can be used to free them from the harness. This will allow for easier transfer into the boat. If the victim is unconscious but breathing, they can remain on the rescue board and taken to the shore more slowly. But if they are not breathing, they have to be transferred into the boat so maximum speed can be used to get them to the shore as quickly as possible before starting CPR. Obviously, as a student, if you end up in the, in the lake, uh, injured or not, you're going to have a lot of adrenaline. Um, how can that affect uh, 
what you should do next. I think if you've come into the world of SIV, you can be pretty maxed out. And so it's quite easy for you to either ignore injuries or just rush to crack on. And I think it's really important that when you end up in the water, you take that time to relax, to float, to live, and to assess yourself and identify any injuries or help uh, the instructor who's getting you in the boat identify if you have any problems before heading right back on up to the navigate. So having looked at those different techniques, where does first aid fit into all of this? Well, I think as you said at the beginning, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because you've got the rescue component and then you also have to adapt kind of the standard first aid practices and first aid training to this particular environment. So to help with that, we've put together a first aid flow uh, that we hope fits in with the rescue techniques that you've seen. And what we'll do now is just go through each section of that flow and look at it in turn and explain kind of our reasoning behind it. The flow is also available in French. And if you'd like to download them, then we'll put a link again in the notes uh, that you can follow. So let's go through this chart step by step. The first step is to ensure that the airway is clear. When somebody lands in the water, especially if the water is cold, their first instinct is to take a big gasp. And if their mouth or nose is under the water at that point, they can inhale a lot of water. That's why it's so important that they have a strong supportive life jacket with a crotch strap to keep their head above the water. Equally, if we arrive and the airway is obstructed by something else, we need to get that out so they can start breathing. We then assess them while they're still in the water. And we're not trying to do a really detailed assessment. We're trying to, to put them into one of three categories. The first, the usual one, is no suspected injury. This is just a pilot who's landed in the water and is fine. And we have to get them out so they can get on with SIV. In the second, it's where we suspect an injury. The injury might be an isolated one. So it might be a rib, a lumbar vertebra, an arm. But we don't think the injury is critical. Critical injuries, and we've given some examples in the box on the right, are those where time really matters in that pilot's treatment. So let's go through each column step by step. In the green column, the usual column, the pilot can help themselves. So they either climb into the boat or we help them into the boat. We untangle, disconnect their equipment and we transfer them to shore still keeping an eye on them because they might be quite shocked by their experience, but we're expecting that we can get them back and get them back in the air. In the middle column, suspected injury, we're going to either secure them on the rescue board or we're going to keep them in the water. Now, this decision is going to depend a lot on circumstances. It might be that the pilot is more comfortable if they have either an isolated injury, for example, a broken arm, or we're worried that they've hurt their back that they stay in the water but secured to the boat and we very gently move them to shore. Or it might be better for them to be on the rescue board. If you are planning to transfer a pilot in the water, be very thoughtful about the water temperature and how long it will take to make the transfer. If you have any doubt that the pilot is deteriorating or that they would get very cold during the transfer, it's best to get them into the boat or onto the board. The reason why is that being cold matters in someone's recovery. The spine is an organ like any other. And so even if we're trying to protect it, we have to protect the whole body and make sure that the pilot is OK. While we're transferring them in this orange column, again, we're going to keep talking to them and keep assessing them during the transfer to shore. And if we have, have any doubts that they might be deteriorating, if, for example, they stop talking to you normally or you have any worries, then we're going to pull them into the boat and go down the red channel. So in the channel on the right, this is the critical injury channel. We're going to secure the pilot to the boat so they don't drift off if they can't help themselves. We're going to quickly cut away the equipment. We're not going to worry about disentangling things or preserving it. We're just going to free it from the pilot. We're then going to pull them into the boat. Now, here is another instance where even if we're worried about spinal injury, we're so worried about that pilot in general that we're going to want them to be in the boat and quickly on shore. We're then going to transfer them rapidly to the shore and we're going to call the emergency services on the way. Once we get to the shore, we're going to reassess the pilot. And this is where we can be a bit more thoughtful as to what's going on. And again, there are three channels here. The green channel on the left is when there's no injury. Again, this is our pilot who's just been in the water and we want to get them back flying. The middle channel where they're injured, the first thing we're actually going to do is remove their wet clothing, dry them and keep them warm. 
And we're actually going to do that before we do any other first aid stuff, because even on a warm day, people get cold really quickly. And staying warm is a really important part of preventing bleeding or injuries getting worse. So we're going to take them out of their wet clothing, dry them, keep them warm. We're going to give them first aid and arrange medical attention that's appropriate to that injury. So that might be an ambulance to hospital or a doctor's appointment later that day. Finally, if the worst happens and there are no signs of life, we're going to start CPR at that stage. So what about spinal injuries? Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth talking about spinal injuries because that, that is often people's worry under these circumstances. So I think like spinal injuries aren't just one thing. We have to think about the mechanism of injury, like how they happen. So most of the time, fortunately, when paraglider pilots end up with back pain, it's because they've injured the muscles, not the bones. Like the muscles are there to protect the bones and they tense up. And it's that tension that helps protect your spinal column. The next most common thing is a compression fracture of your lower back. And while that's serious and important, it rarely threatens the spinal cord. But it's those kind of people who, when we talked about in the first aid flow about transferring water, that you might be able to transfer quite gently in nice warm water back to shore without moving things too much. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that when they do get to shore, if a pilot does have back pain that's quite severe, is go and get it x-rayed. And when you get it x-rayed in the hospital, tell the doctors what you've been doing, because it's not usual practice to x-ray a back for back pain. But if you tell them to have a big fall from height, then they'll probably do that for you. Okay. And I think this is where we kind of bring ourselves into the more severe injuries. So if someone severely injures their back uh, or their neck, there are usually other injuries that accompany it. So injuries to the head or injuries to the chest. And so while we're so focused on the spine, it's actually those injuries that are going to be more important mm -hmm. because the spine's an organ, it's part of your brain, it needs oxygen, it needs blood. And if we just focus on the spinal cord and not moving the parasite and being really gentle and ignore those injuries that can accompany a severe spinal cord injury, then actually we can make things worse for the spine as well. So that's why in the first aid flow, we emphasise if someone has a sign of a severe injury, and as you saw, they're all listed up in the top right, then that's the kind of thing where even if you're worried about the back, you're going to prioritise getting them quickly to shore. Yeah, and, and I think this is where it becomes really important that the person on the boat, if it's not the SIV instructor, it's whoever is in the boat has some form of life-saving training and first aid training because when you first come to them, if they're full of adrenaline and you suspect a back injury, yes, leave them there, but then you need to monitor them and if, and if they deteriorate, then the plan needs to change. So. Without that sort of training, that might not be the most obvious. Yeah, no, I think that's spot on. And that's why we emphasise in the flow the importance of continual reassessment. So coming across someone that needs um, CPR, can you tell me the, the details of when you should do it and um, why, you, if ever, you should delay? Yeah, so this is a good question. I think it's one of the things that people might question about our flow is in that severe channel, that right-hand channel, we say, just get them to the shore. And the reason for that is that when you do CPR, there are two things that matter. It matters that the CPR is effective and it matters that it's continuous. And so if you think about it, trying to do CPR in a boat, especially a solo rescuer, it's gonna be difficult for it to be both of those things. Mm. I mean, the example we were talking about was in hospital, like just doing it on a hospital bed is actually too soft to do effective CPR. Mm. They have special settings to make it kind of really hard and rigid or you pull the person onto the floor. And so, in this flow, what we've emphasised is that if you think that someone has no signs of life, you're getting them quickly to shore, and then on shore you can start effective, continuous CPR that the rescuer can then take over. Yeah. And then I suppose there's a couple of things to consider. If there are other boats and other people available, you could start CPR on a solid surface while someone else drives the boat to shore. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if there are other boats around and other first aid trained people who could help, then by all means have someone jump in, take the harness off so they're against the, the hard floor of the boat, and that person can start CPR while you go back to shore. But to really emphasize this, the important thing in any kind of cardiac arrest is a chain of survival. And that means you taking this person and putting them in the hands of the rescue services as soon as possible. Mm. And so I'd much rather that someone came straight to shore and we started CPR there and handed over to the rescuers really effectively than waiting on the boat and trying to half do it. Mm. And then I think that leads back to um, spinal injury, where of course, um, if someone's not breathing, that takes absolute precedence. and You need to get them out of the harness as quick as possible. Yeah, no, exactly. Like we said, the spine is an organ. It needs to be resuscitated, the same as any other organ. 
So we've covered a lot in this video. Uh, I guess if you were going to sum up your key takeaways, what would they be? I touched on it before, but being first aid trained, the person in the boat being first aid trained is uh, it's really important should this ever happen. Um, and I think the other thing is to have appropriate equipment on the boat, a list of which is, is to the right of the first aid flow chart. Well, for me, the thing I took away from it really is that this has to be practiced. So in medicine, in trauma care and everything, we do a lot of simulation and I think this is no exception. So at the start of the season or when you have a, a quiet moment, that's the time to really work through all your procedures. So go into the lake, have somebody with uh, you know, a wing or an emergency parachute out and think, how am I gonna get this person in and practice every single drill? And not just practice the drills, but also practice how you're gonna hand over to rescue services. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have the numbers to hand, make sure you know where you are, all of these things. Yeah, I think that's really important. Like in, in French, they call it the bilan, but it's the, the report. So um, the more you do this sort of first aid training, the more you start to take note of uh, the time of the accident, uh, you know, the name, age of the student, um, because part of that handover process is really like, when did this happen? What happened? What are, you know, what their name and their age and stuff like that, so you can do a, a quick and efficient handover. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for those who are interested in these kind of things, there's a bunch of different mnemonics online, like SBAR, Atmist, Ethane, and all sorts that you can look up that break down how to do that handover really effectively. Do you think it's going to be easy for schools to adopt this? Um, I think what we've done is quite specific to, to here. So, so first of all, this might not work in every situation if you, if you work on the sea, if you have a bigger boat. Um, so it's just about taking this, use this as like, you know, to plant the seed, to, to, um, to think of your own ideas. And most of what we've covered here is adaptable in any situation. You just have to adapt things slightly. You might have a slightly bigger rescue board or a different way of getting people into the boat. But um, we want to use this as a, as a way for the community to, to think about this and, um, and become safer. That makes sense. So if you're in Oladeniz, take some of the principles that we've covered here, but think, how's this going to work in the sea? How's this going to work with the high side of the boat? Rescue board configuration. The rescue board must be attached to the boat in such a way that it doesn't impede the maximum speed or the manoeuvrability of the boat. It needs to be attached at several points to remain stable enough to carry two people. It needs to be fixed in such a way that even with a casualty on board, the boat can still be manoeuvred. The more the nose can be elevated, the greater the speed can be achieved with a casualty on board. So thank you very much for watching. We hope you found this thought provoking. Just I think remember if you're a student, check out the rescue plans, make sure there's the right equipment, make sure your life jacket is at least 250 newtons, has a crotch strap, and if you do find yourself in the water, keep calm, float to live, and try to just maneuver with your hands and not your feet. Yeah, and then just to the SIB professionals watching this, I hope this has led to you reviewing at least your, your rescue procedures. I think, luckily enough, in this industry, serious accidents don't happen that often, but hopefully you'll, you'll uh, take something from this and take some steps to review your own process. Thank you very much. And this is really just our kind of first effort. So if you find yourself using these procedures and you think this could be better, this doesn't really work, or you have any other feedback, please get in touch with us and we'll happily update the flow and take your feedback on board. Yeah, we would love your feedback.